Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So inshallah today we will be doing uh, Ruku number 11 of Surah Al-Baqarah which are verses 217 to 221. So inshallah we start with this dua. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa un warzukna tiba'a wa arina al-batila batila un warzukna jitinaba. O Allah show us the truth as truth and give us the ability to follow it and show us the falsehood as falsehood and give us the ability to avoid it. Ameen, Ya Rabbal Alameen. So verse number 217 uh, starts with Yes Alunaka Anish Shahril Harami Kitalin Fi. Yes Alunaka is uh, from the root letters Seen Hamza Lam and it basically means they ask you Anish Shahril Harami concern uh, about the month which is sacred Ketalin fihi concerning fighting in it so what what used to happen was is 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 that there were as we had previously studied there were uh, four months which were considered sacred um, and fighting was prohibited in those four months now there was an incident that happened uh, which is called the incident of uh, Nakala, uh, which is basically what caused caused uh, these ayahs, uh, which which is basically what caused Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to reveal these ayahs. Uh, so previously we had talked about some people not liking the mandate of fighting and how Allah knows what is best. Uh, we also talked about the four months. Now Quraysh, uh, they used to do something called Nasi, which is also mentioned in Surah Tauba which was that they used to change the calendar around and change the sacred months. Um, so what used to happen was that they used to start fighting and they would say that, Yo, you know, this month, this year, this month, uh, this sacred month is no longer at this time, but well, it will be at a different time. And that would allow them, uh, they would allow, they would used to allow themselves to fight with others by changing the months around. Now, what happens with that is, is that if a calendar is messed up, one year and then the second year and the third year and so on and so forth pretty soon over the years it gets messed up so much that we don't even that you know one doesn't even know um which year was truly the um the the sacred month now we know prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam when makkah was conquered um at that time in a juma khutbah um, he had uh, he had revealed that Allah subhanahu wa taala has aligned the calendar. So from that point on, we knew the, we, from that point on we know exactly um, you know the, the which months are uh, which uh, which Islamic months fall at what time. Um, and there was an ayah that was revealed about about the twelve months. But coming back to uh, this specific ayah and how uh, the background about this. So here we talk about uh, the uh, the military maneuvers at at Nakala. So this this happened. These ayahs came down because of an incident uh, that happened. And the background of that incident is that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Once they came back from the Battle of Badr, he had selected um, a few Sahabas. All of them were from the Muhajirins, and they were uh, they were sent with with some instructions. Um, uh, so none of the Ansars were included. It was only the Muhajiruns that were included at that time. Um, and uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam also gave them some written instructions and ordered them not to read them until they have marched for two days. Um, and Abdullah bin Jash was uh, the leader of uh, that group that was sent. Um, so when um, when they started when they started um, after two days uh, Abdullah bin Jash opened the um, uh, the the instructions from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, the instructions were uh, were uh, basically telling him that when you read these instructions march until you set camp at Nakala between which is between Mecca and Taif and watch there for the movements of the caravan of Quraysh and collect the news about them for us. Um, so when Abdullah bin Jash, he read the document, he said, I hear and I obey. And he told the companions that this is what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has commanded me uh, to do. And he has prohibited, prohibited me from forcing any of you to come with me. So whoever wants to come with me, they can come with me. Whoever 
does not want to come with me, that is okay. Uh, so there were, um, you know, so basically all of them, you know, continued there and uh, they, they got near the area of Nakala, uh, near the area of the Hijaz area. And that is where uh, there was a, um, uh, there was a uh, caravan uh, that was there. Um, now, when they got there, there was a Sahabi who lost his camel and uh, they went looking for them while the rest of the companions, uh, they continued on. Now, when they got near that, uh, they basically, they basically saw the people from the caravan. Now, the people got scared uh, seeing these companions uh, get there um, and they basically, uh, you know, told them that we are here seeking Umrah, so there is no need uh, to fear them. Um, now the companions, they conferred amongst themselves and that day was the last day in the sacred month, which was the month of Rajab. Uh, so they said, let's this day pass. And then, um, you know, once the day pass, um, and, you know, then we will see what we need to do. Now, um, they did not want to, now they did not want to start any fighting, but incidentally, um, you know, somebody, uh, st started the fight and you know, they got into some argument. And that is where, uh, you know, a couple of people on the on the Kufar side were basically killed. Um, and, uh, you know, th there was obviously a fighting that went on. Some people ran away. Uh, the companions, they got, um, they collected everything that they had left behind, that the, um, uh, that the caravan had left behind and brought it back to Medina. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, at that time, even did not take uh, any of that material that was brought back because he had told them um, not to fight and just to collect the news. So that is when uh, some of these ayahs were revealed um, because some of the people um, of, of the Jews, they basically um, had started saying that, oh, you know, Muslims had uh, started killing in the sacred month and the Mushrikeen started saying that as well. And that is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down Now again, uh, as a reminder, this, this, uh, these were the four months, Zul Qaeda, Muharram, Zul Hijjah, and Rajab. These were the four sacred months. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this, uh, continuing this verse, Qul kitalun fihi kabir. Say fighting therein is a transgression. Qital is from the, is from, are from the root letters Qaf, Ta, Lam, and Kabir is from the root letters Kaf, Ba, Ra, and Kabir means great. Um, and this verse, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying that indeed fighting is a great transgression, is a great sin. Wasaddun an sabilillahi but hindering people or stopping people or preventing the mankind from following the way of Allah, sabilillah, way of Allah, wa kufrum bi, and to disbelieve in him, and him here is referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wal masjid al-harami, and to prevent access to al-masjid al-haram at Makkah, wa ikhraju ahlihi, and to derive out its inhabitants, minhu akbaru in the law, and al and, and to derive out its inhabitants is a much, much, much greater uh, sin uh, near Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal fitna tu akbaru min al qatl. And al fitna is worse than killing. So, in this uh, part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying that indeed fighting is a great sin, but what is a bigger sin is hindering or stopping people from the way of Allah and disbelieving in Allah and stopping people from Masjid al-Haram and driving out their own people wa ikhraju ahlihi minhu. Uh, so this is being, this is referring to the Quraysh who were the Mushrikeens who had driven out all the people when all the Muslims, they had migrated from Makkah to Medina. They were basically driven out of their city of Makkah. And um, Allah basically, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had decreed that the city of Makkah be safe. And Allah is really referring to, you know, you know, when the elephants came, for example, 
before uh, the year when Rasul uh, before Rasulullah was born, uh, when the elephants came down with the with, with the king called Abraham, they came down to destroy Makkah. That Allah had pre- uh, had uh, stopped those armies and prevented from any kind of harm coming to Makkah. And now the d- disbelievers they are driving their own people out, even though those people had lived in that city for years and generations. Um, and again. All of the above is a much greater sin than what had happened. And what had happened was, again, that a battle uh, not the, uh, is basically what transpired at Nakala, uh, is basically what is being referred to. And fitna in this uh, verse, basically fitna means trial, tribulation, and a lot of other things. You know, it sometimes can also mean a difficult situation, uh, could be fitna too. Um, it also means that a test, if you fail in that test, that you will end up in misguidance. And that is what a fitna is. Now, the society of the mushrikeen is set up in such a way that if it is not stopped, then others also get misguided because, because of that. And fitna is much, much bigger than killing. And even though killing is not small, because uh, you know there is a hadith of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that killing even one person is like killing all of humanity. But Messenger of Allah, Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was living in Makkah and people did not accept Islam. And now that he had migrated, how would anybody lead the people or you know, would, would give guidance to the people who were living uh, in Makkah? And this is basically what was causing fitna at that time. So continuing with the verse. Verse uh, 217 continues and says, Wala yazaluna yuqatilunakum. And they will never cease fighting you hatta yaruddukum an dinikum until they turn you back from your religion in istata'u if they can. Now today, Muslims are celebrating all kinds of events, right? Uh, we become take part in, you know, we just went through um, Halloween and there were Muslim kids who go out there and celebrate um, and really follow the first footsteps of the mushrikeen and the disbelievers when, the, when we go out and celebrate events like that because such events like Halloween or birthdays or anything like that is really not in the sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The question that we need to be asking is, do those disbelievers, do they celebrate Eid like we do, right? So if they're not celebrating our events, why should we be celebrating their event, especially when it is not from the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, some people at the time asked the question, if they are not fighting us, why should we fight us? They left us alone. Why should we not leave them alone? And Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala is basically saying that they will never cease fighting you until they turn you back from your, from your religion, if they can. Um, now, what we also need to remember is that Ibrahim alayhi salam, for example, was not calling even before, um, you know, when he started, even before he broke the idols and all that, he was not calling for a new society back then. Uh, he was really um, calling people to oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what was the response of his nation? They wanted to burn him alive. They wanted to kill him and they went, they went against him. So what Allah is, subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us is that the disbelievers will call, will be against us uh, until they turn us back from our religion. Um, and this means, uh, and the last part of this verse, which basically says, if they can, in istata'u, basically means that for the weak amongst us, that is amongst the Muslims, you better watch out because they will be able to affect you know, the weakest of us. So we need to make sure that we, uh, you know, stay close to the, the, the preachings of, of Islam. So what we need to remember is that we need to make sure we are not walking the wrong path and we need to correct our and amend our ways, inshallah. Verse number 217 that continues and says, And whosoever of you turns back from his religion, فَيَمُتْ وَهُوَ كَافِرٌ and dies as a disbeliever. And then his deeds will be lost. Habitat amaluhum will be completely destroyed, will become completely uh, lost. In this life and in the hereafter. And they will be the dwellers of the fire. 
hum fiha khalidun they will abide therein forever the word khalidun is from the root letters kha lam dal which basically means will abide there uh, will abide forever now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that whosoever turns his back and dies in a state of disbelief then the any deeds any good deeds that you may have done also will be completely lost not just in this life but in the hereafter as well and you will never see any benefit of any good deeds that anybody may have done in their life if they die as a disbeliever um now may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from being among such people um now there were obviously at that time and even today there are different categories of muslims uh, that are out there but really what every muslim wants is the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we want his rahma so we the muslims at that time and even right now right we are not struggling to beat the disbelievers or to conquer them or to anything like that all we want is to struggle for the mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because how we are going to enter jannah we are only going to enter jannah by the mercy of allah so option a is denying the truth now it does not hurt the truth but it does hurt you if you deny the truth now 18 then goes on and says in allazina amanu verily those who believed wal lazina hajaru and those who have emigrated for allah's religion wa jahadu fi sabilillah and those who have striven hard in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ulaika yarjuna rahmatullah and all though all these hope for allah's mercy wallahu ghafurur rahim and allah is uh, the most forgiving and now jihad obviously has a wider connotation so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is really talking about um uh, three things three qualifications one is those who believed second is those who emigrated and third is those who have struggled in the way of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and allah is saying that these are the only people who have the right to allah's mercy and now is it easy to leave your home now for the people who had migrated at that time for example from medina from makka to medina it was not easy for them um these were the people who had lived there for generations and generations but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that if you believe and if you emigrate because of you know for allah's religion and if you strive hard in the way of allah wa jahadu fi sabilillah uh, sabil means a uh, way and allah uh, fi sabilillah in the way of allah then only we become eligible for the rahma of of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is jihad again is not just fighting jihad is a lot of things jihad is uh, to struggle when somebody uh, is difficult it's difficult for them to get up for example for fajr in the morning that is jihad too you are striving hard to walk the walk on the way of uh, of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um and this is what we need to do in our daily life is to you know strive hard sometimes for example kids who go to school sometimes it's hard uh for example not to uh you know to to stay away from from certain things for example for for males to stay away from looking at females especially when they are wearing inappropriate clothing things like that but any such actions that we do um uh, which is to stay away from the things that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to stay away from um and to do things that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked us to do which is also a definition of muttaqi and we are striving hard in the way of allah that is when we become eligible for the mercy of allah can be is striving for the truth which is your belief immigration strive um and hope in the mercy of allah then it helps you to 19 um then says yes uh, aluna ka anil khamri wal maisir now in this um uh in, in this verse uh remember that this was a society that was in a desert right so they did not they had a shortage of water um and water and drinks were quite a huge asset um now even today what are some of the most expensive drinks wines are probably one of the most expensive things right um people may not pay that much for a coffee uh but some you know the old older the wine the more expensive it becomes um and it is an expensive commodity and that was the case even back then in in the day of arabia uh, that wine was very very expensive now khamar here means um alcoholic drinks or intoxicants and maisir means uh, gambling khamar is from the root the root letters for khamar are kha mim ra and the root letters for uh, maisir 
our um, ya sin ra. Um, kul fi uh, kul fi hima ismun kabir. Allah subhanahu wa taala is saying kul se fi hima ismun kabir. In them is a great sin. Ismun means sin. Kabir means great. Wa manafi ulindasi and some benefit for men or for mankind. Wa ismuhuma akbar. But the sin of them is greater. Min naf ihima than their benefit. So um, now sometimes uh, you know we, now the both one drinking wine and gambling are basically addictions. Um, now question is. Um, are those the only addictions that people have today? Sometimes people have more addictions. Sometimes, you know, people are addicted to, for example, games um, and they were just not let go of that. Uh, there are other kinds of addictions uh, that people have and we need to think about how much effort or how much time we are spending on some of some of these these addictions. Now, in some cases, sometimes people change some of these words and they say, oh, you know, uh, wine uh, is it is basically has some harm. Um, and they basically switch the word sin with harm, uh, but it also has some benefits. Uh, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly saying that there is sin in it. Um, now, people who are also addicted to, for example, wine and gambling, they spend a lot of money uh, on, on these things um, and waste a lot of money. Um, now, if somebody stops and stops drinking or gambling, they will have a lot of money left over. So to remember is alcohol is the mother um, now there are some people today who may have gas stations or convenience stores and they may be selling alcohol there. So we also need to remember is, is that if we are engaged in a business, uh, you know, where the money that we are earning is not, is not halal, then even if you're giving sadaqa or even if we are, you know, giving that money in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all that money does not become halal because we are not earning it uh, in a halal. Now, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam cursed 10 kinds of people who were associated with alcoholic beverages, those who make them, those who help make it, those who use it, those who carry it, those who um, uh, give it to others, those who sell it, those who use the money made from it, those who purchase it, those for whom it is purchased. Now, also remember, sometimes, you know, in, in, in living in America, sometimes, uh, you know, some of our Muslim kids, they may even go out and, for example, work in uh, grocery stores. Uh, but the challenge over there is that sometimes you have to check out wine that people are buying it because non-believers, uh, disbelievers, uh, you know, they're obviously engaged in these activities. So we need to stay away from any such thing where we will run into uh, either selling of wine, touching of wine, things like that. And also, also have to be very careful. These days now they have come out with non-alcoholic beverages in bottles which are shaped like alcoholic beverages. And sometimes it becomes confusing. So it's rather it's better for you to stay away from anything that causes doubt versus, um, you know, staying with something, um, uh, you know, versus versus following up on it. Uh, so it's better to avoid it when when in doubt. So verse number 219 then continues. Now, if people have stopped gambling and drinking, they have a lot of money left over. So the next natural uh, part of the verse is why yes, Aluna Kamaza Yunfikun, and they ask you what they ought to spend. Kulil Afwa, say that which is beyond your needs. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not saying here, you know, give 5% or 10% or 20% or whatever it is, just whatever is surplus. And it may not be just money, it could be other things that you may have. Let's say you have, you know, uh, two of the same things and you want to give one away for this well, one thing away for the sake of Allah. But also remember that we should not give things which are which is something which we don't want to keep for our own self, right? Something is not working and we say, oh, you know, let's give it, donate it to somebody because it's not working. That should not be the case. The donations should always be those items that are the very best, right? New if possible, uh, because that will inshallah open up our heart. Kazalika yubayyinullahu lakumul ayati. Thus Allah makes clear to you his laws in order that you may in order that you may give some thought. Uh, you may give some thought. Uh, now the word tatafakkarun are the root, it is from uh, the root letters fa, kaf, ra, which basically means to ponder, to think about, to give some thought. So 
we need to be a thinker. We need to think about uh, things that have been given to us in various different shapes and forms um, and make sure that we are inshallah taking the benefit from the Quran, from the things that are around us, uh, learning from others, uh, learning from our own mistakes. So we need to be a thinker. And Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's hadith uh, of Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which basically says uh, that Abu Huraira, uh, you know, said that a man said, O Messenger of Allah, I have a dinar. The Prophet said, Rasul Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, uh, spend it on yourself. He said, I have another dinar. He sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, spend it on your family. The man said, I have another dinar. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, spend it on your offspring. And the man said, I have another dinar. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, you have better knowledge, which basically means that you spend it how you deem it better. And it's better to spend it in charity. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to fix our earnings and spending matters, inshallah. Verse 220 says, fit dunya wal akhira in this worldly life and in the hereafter. Now, what is the connection between this life and the hereafter? Now, if we don't think about the hereafter, then it is hard to give in the way of Allah in this life. Spending for the hereafter is like spending for a retirement account. People save money for challenges ahead. Muslims spend money in the way of Allah to save themselves from the challenges in the hereafter. It's basically when you're spending in the way of Allah, it's like spending from one account of yours, which is, you know, where you might have money in there to spending in another account, which is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give um, each one, each and every person the reward of whatever one spends in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both accounts are owned by that one person. Now the verse then continues and says, well, yes, alunaka anil yatama. Uh, now it comes, when it comes talk when the conversation is, where do we spend? Or what do we spend? Now the question is, and they ask you about concerning orphans. A hadith, hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, the one who cares for an orphan and myself will be together in paradise like these, like this. And he held two fingers together. And this is a hadith in Bukhari. So let's make sure that we are taking care of orphans. There was an event uh, that that was that we did a while back, uh, which was to spawn, uh, to raise some money for sponsoring some orphans. And each one of us, inshallah, should should make an effort uh, to uh, spend, to sponsor orphans. There's obviously a lot of organizations uh, that work with orphans overseas and even here in the U.S. as well. And as much we can take care of those orphans, inshallah, subhanahu inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa taala is going to reward each and every one of you for that, inshallah. So verse 220 then continues and says, Kul islahu lahum khair. Now there was an ayah that was revealed. Um, uh, so Kul islahu lahum khair, which basically means say the best thing is to work honestly in their property. And again, this is about, uh, you know, ayah, the continuation of orphans. So there was an ayah that was revealed, which basically uh, was, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim, Wala taqrabu maal al-yateem illa billati hiya asan, and come not near to the orphan's property, except to improve it. Um, verily, those who unjustly eat up the property of orphans, they eat up only fire into their bellies and they will be burnt in the blazing fire. So this was a verse that was revealed and people were then concerned, then how do we really take care of the orphans? And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is revealing here is, is the best thing is to work honestly um, in their property. And um, this ayah was revealed when people had asked this question to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah sent these verses down as a guidance. Um, so um, the verse then continues and says, in fa And if you mix your affairs with theirs, then they are your brothers. So first off, what what um, uh, uh, what what people were doing at the time was is that when this verse, when the verse came down that you're filling up your bellies with fire, um, you know, if you're mixing um, your property with the property of orphans, uh, people are very concerned. They separated everything, right? For, for some people who were taking care of the orphans, they even separated cooking food for them so that nothing was, you know, uh, mixed up 
with what they owned and what was the property of the orphans. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Islam obviously has been sent down to make things easy for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later sent this verse down and, and says, if you do mix your affairs with theirs, then they are your brothers. They don't worry about it if you mix your affairs with theirs, uh, with theirs because Allah um, uh, then they should become, then the orphan should become your brothers. Wallahu ya'lamul mufsida min al musli, and Allah knows him who means mischief from him who means good. Now, what we also need to remember is this is not just true of the orphans, but this is also true in our daily life as well that Allah knows everything. Um, what is in our heart, what we are thinking, whether we are thinking of uh, causing harm to somebody, whether that's, um, you know, harm in terms of harming somebody's reputation or um, you know any other harm like a physical harm as well or if we are wanting uh, good for somebody else walau allahu la'anatakum inna allah azizun hakim and if allah had wished he could have put you into difficulties inna allah azizun hakim truly allah is almighty and all wise now this verse number 221, which is the last um, ayah for, for today, inshallah, um, it, it says, وَلَا, uh, وَلَا حَتَّى um, And do not marry al-mushrikat till they believe or worship Allah alone. Now the last ayah was about the orphans and how they were very worried about mixing their things with the orphans and what Allah had said. Now the subject of this ayah uh, you know, comes up um, very frequently, uh, even for us today also, specifically when we are living here in the United States of America. Uh, you know, teenagers and young adults have a lot of distractions, right? We, you know, when you go to middle school, high school, um, you know, there's obviously a lot of challenges in terms of gender mix up uh, that happens. And obviously there is a natural tendency as, as, um, as we grow up and we get into the teenage years uh, for the opposite uh, sex, uh, you know, for, uh, to attract each other. Um, and then obviously what happens is, is that the parents in the society are working most of the times. And sometimes parents only get to see uh, their kids for really just a couple to a few hours in a day. And the rest of the time, the kids are really on their own and they become you know, their own personalities. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is really saying in this verse, Wala tankihul mushrikati hatta yu'min and do not marry al-mushrikat till they believe, which is that you know, they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wali ammatum mu'minatun khayrum mim mushrikati walau ajabatkum. And indeed, a slave woman who believes is better, who believes, that is, believes in Allah, mu'minatun, uh, uh, which basically means, uh, you know, a woman who believes uh, is better than a free mushrika, which is uh, somebody who does not believe in Allah, even though she pleases you. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that do not marry women who have shady characters um, or who uh, do not have the gift of Iman. And sometimes, you know, what happens is, is that, uh, you know, when, when uh, into teenage years, into high school or even sometimes into college, uh, you know, a, a boy will be, will just bring some girl home or vice versa. And they will say, oh, you know, we want to marry this other person. And, uh, you know, he has, uh, you know, just converted to Islam as well. Um, uh, and, you know, but we also need to make sure that we are not judging, you know, these kind of situations because we cannot judge uh, the Iman of, of somebody else. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, uh, you know, is uh, uh, also uh, as part of the continuation of this verse also says, وَلَا تُنْكِهُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ حَتَّى يؤمنوا. And give not your daughters in marriage to al mushrikun till they believe in Allah alone. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is obviously giving an advice uh, to the men in the first part of this verse, which is basically saying that do not marry uh, disbelieving women. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying in the second part of this verse that do not give in your daughters uh, to disbelieving men. Now, this also implies, the second part of the verse also implies that uh, when girls should marry, they should have a consent of their wali, which is could be you know, which is basically you know, uh, uh, you know, some some responsible adult uh, it could be their father, uh, you know, if the father is not alive, you know, could be could be one of the other blood relatives, but basically some wali, uh, because in Islam, um, a girl if she wants to marry somebody, she needs to have a consent. 
Now, what happens is, is that sometimes um, in, in today's society, it should not be that the girls should just go off and marry on their own. Uh, now, this does not mean that the girls have no say in who they marry. They absolutely have a say in Islam. Um, and what happens is, is that when the nikah happens, there is a transfer of responsibility that takes place between the father to the future husband. Um, so, um, uh, but again, what we need to make sure of is that when we are marrying somebody else, whether it's a girl marrying a boy or a boy marrying a girl, that we are marrying the other person uh, b based on what they believe in uh, and that they, they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not marrying a disbeliever. وَلَا عَبْدٌ مُؤْمِنٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن مُشْرِكٍ وَلَوْ عَجَبَكُمْ And verily, a believing slave is better than a free mushrik, uh, even though he pleases you. Um, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is setting the stage uh, by saying this. Now, the only marriage proposal that is talked about in the Quran is the marriage proposal of Musa alayhi salam. In that, uh, it basically, in that um, uh, description, uh, Musa alayhi salam is shown talking to his uh, father-in-law, um, uh, you know, when, when he was discussing uh, the marriage. Uh, so again, there's a lot of things that we can learn uh, from, you know, from, from that, from that um, account of Musa alayhi salam talking to his father-in-law and how that discussion needs to go. But again, what we need to remember is that marriage in Islam is a lifetime investment, is a form of ibadah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam referred to nikah as half of deen. So marriage is obviously a very, very important institution uh, that one needs to, uh, you know, take take absolute care of uh, when, when, when tying the knot. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that women are married for four qualities. Some are married for wealth. Some are married for the family status, some are married for beauty, and some are married for the deen. And we should marry a woman for her deen. And if one does so, they should be, they inshallah will be happy and successful. Rasulullah said, if a man comes to you seeking marriage and you are satisfied with his deen and character, marry him uh, lest a fitna and great destruction and you know uh, if that doesn't happen then a fitna and a great destruction will become rampant on the earth woman's wali uh, a marriage contract for a woman is not valid without a wali and wali could be a father or grandfather a son a brother uncle etc and the last part of this verse says those um, which is the mushrikuns invite you to the fire wallahu yadu ila jannati wal maghfirati bi idni but allah invites you to paradise ila jannati to paradise wal maghfirati and to forgiveness bi idni by his leave wa yubayyinu ayatihi and makes his ayat which is his proofs and evidences and signs and lessons lin nasi clear to the mankind that they may remember. So we need to make this dua to Allah. Allah ala dhikrika wa shukrika wa husni ibadatik. Oh Allah, assist me in remembering you, in thanking you, and in worshipping you in the best of manners. We get to the ruku check for ruku number 11. Uh, obviously, it talks about certain Islamic rulings, and the questions that we have is, do I know that fitna is more severe than killing? Do I know the three things to do uh, to expect the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these things, three things were talked about in verse 218. Can I drink wine and do gambling? This is a question that we need to ask our own selves. Uh, do I feel more motivated to take care of orphans? Can we marry polytheistic women, which is the disbelieving men or women who do not believe? So what do we need to do from this point on? These are questions that we need to answer on our own. We need to reflect then we choose and then we act inshallah please please write down your favorite gems for the day inshallah hopefully uh, you were able to collect uh, one or more gems from all these beautiful verses of uh, quran uh, sent to us by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala
inshallah we will share it next time uh, uh, the lessons that we learned from these ayat ربنا تقبل منا انك انت السميع العليم وتوب علينا انك انت التواب الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته